Looks like everybody survived the deluge. Believe it or not, according to the calendar, it is still summer outside, so I hope you get out and enjoy it this afternoon. (laughs) We're going to begin uh, this morning by reading a verse really from the middle of our passage today, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, what I think is Paul's thesis statement for this entire section of the letter. Chapter 12, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So I'll I'll define some terms briefly here. Each would mean each Christian, each person who's connected to Jesus by his Spirit, belongs to Jesus as one of his people. Spirit would mean the Spirit of God, the third person of the Holy Trinity. You might be able to tell from this verse, these are deep waters that we're going to be swimming in this morning. We're looking at these first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 12. And what we find in this little section of verses right here is nothing less than the intersection of natural and supernatural, heaven and earth, the human and the divine right here in these verses. And believe it or not, right here in this room, this gathering that we call Fellowship Bible Church. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There's going to be a lot of uh, information in this sermon today, all right? Just a lot of kind of straight-up teaching. But I would hate for us to lose the wonder of all this in that pile of information. God's Spirit, Paul says, is here in me, in you, among us. This same Spirit who lives eternally in fellowship with Father and with Son, the same Spirit who is all-powerful, uncreated, the same Spirit who brooded over the waters before creation is right here in in the person sitting next to you. The ordinary meets the extraordinary. God's Spirit among us the heavenly among the humans. So we're going to be doing this sermon just a little bit differently today. It's going to be like a a question and answer format, kind of the the, the whole thing through. Eight questions, actually, is how they're, they're listed in your handout there. Eight questions with eight answers and eight principles leading to one takeaway and then two warnings at the end, all right? All focused around this one topic right here, the gifts that we receive from God's Spirit. Those would be the the manifestations that Paul mentions right there. Or really, as he starts out this whole section in verse 1 right there, now concerning spiritual gifts. All right, that is how Paul introduces this discussion, this this change in topic, right? When he says those words, now concerning, that's when you know, all right, he's going back to something different, something probably that was a, a question that the Corinthians had asked him in that letter that they had sent him. No more talk about Lord's table or men and women in worship, right? For now, it's on to another topic, spiritual gifts. Which leads us to question number one, why do I even need this? Do I, do I really need to know all this stuff about spiritual gift? And, and uh, the reason that it says all this stuff up there is because we're not just spending this week on this. We're not just spending next week on this or the, next, the week after that. Believe it or not, this whole section of 1 Corinthians all the way till really the end of chapter 14 is somehow connected to spiritual gifts, even that famous chapter on love in, in 1 Corinthians 13. So we're going to actually be spending seven weeks on this topic in, in some form or another. They're not all going to be the same sermon, but seven weeks on spiritual gifts. That's like almost to Thanksgiving, right? Have you done your Christmas shopping yet? Hopefully this should be making you think about that. When I, when I mentioned this to our, our small group last week, that we'd be spending this long on, on spiritual gifts, Lydia Collins actually groaned as, as if she was in pain. Just like, oh, seven weeks on spiritual gifts? Really? Is anyone, does anyone else feel Lydia on that one? Like, you know, maybe if you were scrolling through a list of sermons, looking for something to listen to to really boost you up and encourage you this week, maybe spiritual gifts wouldn't be the one that you would click on very first. Well, if, if that is how you feel, Paul has something to say to you. Yes, you do need to know all this stuff about spiritual gifts. Look at the rest of verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers... I do not want you to be uninformed. 
You know, uninformed is actually a pretty soft way to translate that word right there. The word could also mean ignorant, like, like totally clueless. It, it could really be Paul giving kind of a subtle dig at the Corinthian Christians here. Because as, as we're going to see moving forward, they thought that they were like experts when it came to the spiritual gifts. These spiritual giants would have these flashy displays of, you know, supernatural power and, and all this stuff. And, and no, you're not experts. Paul, Paul is saying here. Let's just pump the brakes on that whole hyper-spiritual attitude for a minute, all right? You're, you're potentially uninformed. I don't want that because that ignorance could cost you. How? It's really the question I just want us to park on for a minute here at the beginning of the service. What is the cost of ignorance when it comes to spiritual gifts? What, what is the cost of that? Because the arrogance of the Corinthians was definitely costing them. We're going to get into a lot of these issues as we move forward over the next seven weeks. But, but what might this ignorance cost you? cost us right here, right now. I'm just going to suggest three ways here at the beginning. And, and, and first, if you don't know about spiritual gifts, the community suffers. All right? that, that's something that Paul just makes crystal clear moving on in this chapter. What you don't know about spiritual gifts hurts your church. It's the primary place that will suffer because of this. But second, if you're uninformed about spiritual gifts, you suffer. Not just your church, but you too. Uh, Really, this idea of stewardship runs throughout Scripture. That is, that when God gives us something, we are responsible for how we use it. Stewardship applies to spiritual gifts. If, If God has given us a gift, then our responsibility as stewards is, first of all, to use it, but then second of all, to use it well, to use it properly, appropriately, as he would have us do it. And someday, we're going to have to give an account the judge of the universe and the giver of this letter that we have right in front of us will not be impressed if you try to cite ignorance as an excuse for why you didn't use your spiritual gift or used it improperly. He would say, didn't you get my letter from Paul to those Corinthians? Yes. Third, ignorance about spiritual gifts is not just something that makes you suffer or the community suffer. Really, at its core, ignorance about spiritual gifts could be an insult to the giver, to God. You know, I remember one time spending the night um, at one of my friend's house. I think I was like six or seven. And while I was there in his room, I saw a picture of a tank in his garbage can. It was a, you know, a hand-drawn, hand-painted picture. And it wasn't a particularly uh, great picture. You know, the colors were messed up pretty much outside the lines and stuff. But when I saw that picture in his garbage can, it felt like someone had, had punched me in the gut. And that was because... I'd given him that picture. I had painted it, you know, at, at school. And, and it, was, it was a gift from me to him for him to treasure forever. Maybe pass on as a family heirloom someday. I don't know. So, so what was it doing right there in the trash? You know? So you get the point of that, right? It, it's to neglect a gift is to insult the giver. This is why, you know, when, when grandma was coming over for a visit, your mom would always make you put on that turtleneck she had knitted you last Christmas, even if it was a 90-degree day in July, right? It's like, granny's coming. You're going to wear that sweater. You have to do that lest you dishonor the giver. So how much more is this true when the giver of these gifts is God? If what Paul says in, in, that, in that thesis statement is true, if God really has given each one of us a gift, then to ignore that gift is nothing less than an insult to the generosity of our Creator and Savior. So yes, you need to know about spiritual gifts. Paul doesn't want you to be uninformed, neither do I. So on to question number two. Different angle, really just as foundational to this discussion. Does all religious experience come from God's Spirit? And Paul's answer there is no. Look look at verses 2 and 3. This is really where Paul begins and grounds this entire discussion. You know that when you, Corinthians, were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, at first read, these two verses right here might seem like the most confusing verses in this, in this whole section. Like, why would Paul even need to say that part about Jesus is accursed? Was, was someone in Corinth actually saying that in, in a worship service and thinking that that, that, that was okay? Well, well, I don't think so. What, what I think that Paul is doing right here is looking backward 
as kind of an initial grounding of this discussion. Back to the Corinthians' religious past to illustrate an important truth about God's spirit right now for them in the present. And he does this by introducing three categories. The first category would be that of pagans in verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Meaning, you know, whichever direction you were led. Led this way, led that way. Whatever way your religious culture was pulling you, kind of like an ox with a ring around its nose, right? Just whatever way those idols were jerking them, that is the way these Corinthians were going to go. Just helpless in that sense. And notice also here how Paul calls the idols mute, Meaning they don't talk. They just kind of stand there, stone-faced, right? <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, he's going to talk a lot about speaking and, and the active speaking of God's living spirit as we move forward in this chapter. So just kind of keep that contrast in mind. Then a second category that Paul introduces is the category of Jews. That's really what I think that Paul's getting that with in, in verse 3 there when he says, No one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. Okay, that, that, that term accursed, it's, it's anathema in the Greek, kind of similar to our, our English term. It's a distinctively Jewish term that means condemned or outside of God's protection. All right? We see this a lot from, in, in Jewish writings uh, at the time when they're speaking of those who have departed from the, the faith. And so it's really, to me, it's not hard at all to imagine a Jewish person at this time in Corinth saying this about the Christians or about Jesus. We read in the book of Acts, there's a really a cool, vivid account of Paul's first visit to the city of Corinth when he first shared the gospel. First place he went to was the synagogue. And what happened when the Jews heard his message of Jesus? They reviled him, is the exact term, reviled. So said horrible things about him and the message that he was giving. So horrible that Paul like shakes out all of his garments, every piece of dust off them, and then says, that's it, I'm going to the the Gentiles and goes next door. They reviled him cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, is what we read in the Old Testament, meaning that to a Jew, Jesus' death on the cross would have really labeled him as someone who's accursed, stricken by God and afflicted, as it it says in Isaiah. And this is what makes the cross a stumbling block to the Jews, as Paul says even earlier in the letter. So no, sadly, it is not at all hard to imagine a Jew making this exact statement right here, Jesus is accursed. He was crucified. What else could he be? So I think that the point Paul's trying to make in these two categories is this, that not all religious experience comes from the Spirit of God. Everyone in Corinth who had become a Christian had come from some sort of religious background at this point, either pagan, which would be the case for most of them, or Jewish, which was the case for some of them. And probably all of these people from that background had tasted some sort of religious or supernatural type experience, maybe a trance or a vision like people would have in these pagan temples, or maybe just this warm feeling that, you know, you're part of something bigger than yourself, maybe something divine, supernatural. And what Paul's saying right here in these verses is that does not necessarily mean that what you were experiencing had anything to do with God or his spirit. Doctrine trumps experience, always. That's the next blank in your notes there, that doctrine is greater than experience when it comes to determining what is true, what is from God's spirit. It's really a fundamental distinction we're going to continue exploring over these next um, seven weeks as, as we work through this chap- uh, this, these next few chapters. And that is that doctrine is greater than experience. The content of your faith is more important than the feeling of your faith without exception. Which is what Paul really makes clear when he ends it with that third category right there, true believers. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So the most most fundamental sign that you really do have the the Spirit of God is not, you know, some flashy experience or something like that. It is that you call Jesus Lord, meaning ruler, king, um, the the God of your heart, the one who's in charge most fundamentally. And obviously, Paul is talking about call here in a really a robust sense, right? Not just uh, lip service. Not just saying the words, Jesus is Lord, but then doing, you know, whatever you want with your life. But this is acknowledging Jesus' lordship in a way that really brings every aspect of your life under his control. And the only way that anyone can ever do this is through the powerful influence of the Holy Spirit in their heart. There's no other way. As Jesus himself says in the Gospel of John, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he does that drawing through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So really what Paul's saying here is like, if, do you want to know if you have the Spirit in your life at all before we get on to this, this discussion of spiritual gifts? Well, let me ask you another question. What do you believe about Jesus? The content of your belief is what matters, not the nature of your experience. We're going to get into this a lot more over the next few weeks. So for now, on to question number three. What is a spiritual gift? Well, uh, to paraphrase my friend Russ Glessner, a spiritual gift is a God-given ability to serve your church family. God-given ability to serve your church family. There's a lot in that definition right there, but just let me highlight um, one point, and that is that these gifts are spiritual, not because, uh, you know, they're non-physical or somehow um, intangible, like magical sort of things, but these gifts are spiritual because they come from the Spirit, right? That would be spiritual gifts with a capital S, if you know what I mean. Actually, sometimes I wish that we would always write the term that way, spiritual gifts with a capital S, just to kind of clear up confusion about that. Because so many times we hear the word spirit and we think of it as kind of the opposite of matter, right? Like spiritual reality in contrast to physical reality, spiritual reality being something invisible, intangible, less real, than all the stuff we can like see and and touch around us. Well, that is not what Paul's saying here. He's not trying to make that contrast. When Paul describes spiritual gifts, it's very clear that he's talking about, you know, real abilities, like real stuff that we say with with words or that we do with our, our bodies and with our actions that actually might appear very mundane or ordinary on the surface. But these abilities are spiritual, not because they're invisible or magical, but because their source is God's Spirit, capital S. They're given by the Spirit. They're empowered by the Spirit. They allow you to partner with the work of the Spirit right here in your church. This is why Paul refers to them as a manifestation of the Spirit right there in verse 7. Like manifestation means um, revealing, right? Or making visible. So your gift is a revelation to everyone around you of the Spirit's work in your life. It's you making visible the invisible presence of the Spirit through your specific tangible service to other people. Like I said, this is, uh, this is pretty profound stuff right here. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to go quickly over it, but it is amazing if you stop and think about it. Next question right here, a little bit more straightforward. What do I need to do to get my gift? The answer is nothing. It's a gift. All right. This is something really Paul makes very clear throughout this entire passage, but especially right there in verse four. Now there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit. That word for uh, gifts right there is actually from uh, the word for grace. It's, it's formed from that word. So you can actually call it like gracings if you wanted to, or freely given gifts is a way a lot of people put this. So this is like, uh, they're grace gifts. There are no strings attached kind of gifts. They're the gifts that you don't do anything to earn type of gifts. In other words, really just the definition of a gift in the biblical sense. So what this means, and oh, let me tell you, what, what a big difference this realization could have made in the church in Corinth. This means that spiritual gifts provide no basis for pride or shame. They don't. They're, they are gifts, right? So if you have one gift and, and not another gift, you can't, you can't be proud of that because it was given to you as a gift. You didn't do anything to earn it. Same as if you have one gift and not another gift, you can't be ashamed of that. Because it wasn't your choice. It was, it was given to you as a gift. Being, uh, you know, proud or ashamed of a gift is being like uh, proud or ashamed of the color of your eyes, right? You didn't do anything to, to earn or deserve the eye color you have. But this doesn't mean that other people can't enjoy your eyes. This doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your eyes yourself. It simply means that your eye color is a gift. So there's no room for pride or shame. Same with the gifts of the Spirit. On to question number five. Who has a gift? The answer, everyone. Verse four. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. 
to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Then down there in verse 11, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. I mean, so just look again how out of his way Paul goes to emphasize the universal nature of these gifts among Christians. All in everyone, to each, all to each. You know, it's just, uh, everybody's got a gift, Paul's saying, without exception. Nobody's, no, nobody's left out, right? There is no special class of gifted Christians, right? We're all in the gifted program. <laughs> Praise the Lord. My, my wife uh, taught uh, first grade for years in the, the Kent Public School uh, District, and there was always controversy every year at the end of first grade when the kids took this test, and some got in the gifted program and some didn't. We don't have that here, right? We, we're all in the gifted program. That's why we're all in this room together. We're all very, very special that way. However, question number six, do we all have the same gifts? The ad answer is no, and really therein lay many of the problems they were experiencing in the church at Corinth. Look at verses 7, 11, 7 through 11. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. There are a lot lot going on in these verses right here, but maybe the clearest theme in this whole section is that God delights in diversity and unity. Diversity and unity. Really, everything that you read in this whole section can be seen as falling and emphasizing one of those two poles, right? First, diversity. Uh, you've got, you know, varieties back in verses 4, 5, and 6 repeated over and over again. And then here, to each, to one another, to another, to another, to another, to another. And then to each one individually as he wills, just emphasizing this individual personalized nature of every single gift. It's also why he lists off all these different gifts by name, utterance of wisdom, utterance of knowledge, interpretation of tongues, all that. This whole laundry list just shows the remarkable diversity of giftings within a local church. And I should point out that this list right here is not complete, meaning that these are not all the gifts that that we find in the Bible. Paul has other lists of spiritual gifts elsewhere where he includes other ways that the Spirit might be manifested uh, among us. This list is what you would say, it's it's representative, not comprehensive, all right? Notice, too, that the gifts that are listed here pretty much all sound like they're kind of on the, uh, the flashier end of the spectrum, right? Stuff that would be just noticeably supernatural for for the most part, or miraculous. Um, Quite a bit of debate among Christians these days, as you've probably heard about how these gifts should operate in a church today, or if they should operate in a church today, right? We're going to be really exploring a lot of those questions over the next several weeks, especially when we get to the end of chapter 13 and the beginning of 14. I think that that's really the, the parts of this section here that are more instructive for those questions of, you know, should we be speaking in tongues today? What, what does prophecy look like at, at Fellowship Bible Church right now? Seri- p- big questions that, I mean, there are major books uh, written on this. So I'm looking forward to exploring them uh, with all of you here in, in just a few weeks. So if you can, hold on to those questions for now and, and just get this. We don't all have the same gifts, and that's okay. God has built into his church remarkable variety and at the same time incredible unity. Look look at this. We've got the one spirit, the same spirit, the same spirit. And then really about as emphatic as you can make it in in the Greek, that last, that last part right there. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit. Diversity of manifestations, unity of source, that is what it looks like to be a church. And this is all part of God's plan. Question number seven, who decides who gets each gift? The answer is God. Verse 11, all these, meaning all these diverse gifts, the ones just listed off, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit 
who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So here's another reason that you shouldn't take too much pride in your gift. It was apportioned by God the Spirit, not determined by your worthiness or lack of it. Apportions um, meanings, means like distributed or measured out. Like you could think of a coach, you know, positioning his players on, on a football field for a particular play or a, like a commander handing out weapons to his soldiers before a battle. You get this one, you get that, all carefully planned out and coordinated by this God who made you, this God who saved you, the God who wants to use you to accomplish his work and his plan right here in your local congregation. It is just such clearly intentional language in this verse, and it is so contrary to the, to the view of humanity, really, that prevails in our society right now. Uh, the, 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 the view of our culture when it comes to who are you as a person is really summed up so well by uh, Heidegger's concept of geworfenheit or thrownness is, is how that is translated in English. It's basically just this idea that humans find themselves like thrown into this life at random. We come to this realization that we're just kind of this, this product of eons of impersonal forces, genes, biology, sociology, the house we're born in, the people that we lived around, environment, and now we have to deal with all this as a person. It's just like this realization that we're just a thrown-together dude in a thrown-together world trying to stumble our way through this life that we didn't ask to be born into. How do we deal with that? Thrownness and, and the panic that comes from it, that is the human condition, according to Heidegger. And uh, you guys may, not, may or may not have heard or memorized that term back in philosophy class, but uh, you old dudes out there who still listen to the doors, I mean, you probably <laughs> knew exactly what I was talking about because the very first verse of their 1971 hit, Riders on the Storm, into this house we're born. Into this world we're thrown like a dog without a bone, an actor out on loan, Riders on the Storm. And then that verse, you know, it's repeated like, I think, 19 other times over the course of that song. Because I actually, I heard a guy sing that song one time at karaoke. It is like the best song. If, if you're a guy with a low voice and marginal singing ability, this is your new karaoke jam. Because it is just that same thing over and over, over and over for seven and a half minutes. I actually looked up the length of the song, seven and a half minutes. Yeah, I, I always thought my dad should do it because he's got like, you were built for that song. Someday. <laughs> Someday, maybe. Anyway, the point here is this. What Paul's making clear is that there is no thrownness in the Christian life. There's not. In the plan and in the foreknowledge of God, the Spirit calls people into fellowship intentionally. And in the plan and foreknowledge of God, the Spirit then gives each of the people who he calls a gift uh, you know, intentionally, carefully, not, not sloppily or, or thrown together is this Christian community. God is building the church, Paul says earlier in the letter, like, like an architect or a master builder is, is the specific term that he used. And, and you, my brothers and sisters right here at Fellowship Bible Church, you are the bricks that God has chosen, that God has cut into a shape in line in the plan of his purpose. Which really brings us to question number eight, which, which is, I think, the key thing for us to zero in on this morning. Why do we have these gifts in the first place? And that answer is for the common good. God has given you a gift, and this is not a gift for you. It is a gift through you to the church. Your gift is not for you, but a gift through you. This is just... You know, so opposite of the way that the Corinthians were thinking, apparently. Because they saw their gifts as for their good, right? Like to, to promote their status, to, to boost their prestige, increase their profile, raise their platform a little bit. But, but Paul calls them to a totally different way of thinking. The right way of thinking that God has given you your gifts for the good of others, not yourself. You know, once again, we find ourselves treading in some deep water, this simple yet profound concept that really permeates all of Scripture. 
God blesses you to bless others. It's your takeaway for today. God blesses you, meaning gives to you, enriches you, not to make your life better, not to boost your status or your prestige, but so then you can just turn right around and give to others. This is, this is such a major theme of, of the Bible. God blesses Abraham to be a blessing to all people. God blesses the nation of Israel to be a light to the nations. God blesses the people, his people in Jesus to be a blessing to everyone. A city on a hill, he says. Salt, light that brings light to the whole room. This is why God gives to us so that we can partner with him in his plan of giving to others. Really, this is true of spiritual gifts. This is true of of, of anything that God gives to us. Has, Has God given you good health? Well, he didn't just do that for you. God did that so that through you, your good health might be a blessing to other people. Has God blessed you with money? God did not do that for you. He did that so that through you, your money might be a blessing to others. Has has God blessed you with intelligence or with strength or skill in in some sort of craft or, or beauty or wisdom or even just, you know, a pair of hands and a willing heart? He didn't do that for you, but that through you, everything you have and everything you are might be a blessing to other people, a testament to his character and his generosity to every person in through his son, Jesus Christ. And believe it or not, that is where you will find joy too, in the giving of your gifts, not the keeping of them. He who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is your takeaway for the day. This is where this discussion of spiritual gifts really needs to begin, and that is that God has blessed you to be a blessing. And really, notice the order of this, right? This is, this is important. This is gospel order. It, it is God's work first, foundationally, and then your work second, flowing out of that. First the gift, then the giving. First, this radical free life in Jesus that, you know, he gives to anyone who opens their arms to receive it. And then the radical generosity that flows out of your changed heart. Grace first, then giving. Blessed to be a blessing. And the specific form that this principle takes right here and for the next three chapters is God blessing each of you with a spiritual gift for the good of the Christian community, your church. So now a warning. All along in this letter, Paul has been trying to correct bad thinking, bad habits that the Corinthians have picked up from their, from their culture. Debugging the church is, is what we've called this series, like, you know, like taking out bad code from a computer program, cultural viruses that are wreaking havoc on our church system. So what about us? I mean, what are some cultural values that perhaps we've picked up that might be wrecking this glorious project that God is trying to build right here at 3806 East Portland Avenue. Well, there's two ways that I want to highlight this morning as as we close this out. Two ways that we can ruin the beauty of these beautiful gifts that God has given right here to us through his spirit. And that is, number one, neglect your church. You know, if if, if what Paul says here is true, if, if each person truly has been blessed through Jesus with a manifestation of the spirit, a gift, And if the purpose of that gift is to build up the Christian community for the common good, as he puts it, then what is going on right here, right now in this room this morning, is is, it's far more important than, than you realize. You are far more important than you realize, too, what's going on right here. You're needed. You know, we we need you here at this church. You have a gift, and it's a gift that is not for your own good. It's a gift for our good. That's, that's why God gave it to you. So if, if you neglect your church, you know, it's not just you that's missing out. It's us. You know, I was, I was talking to a friend about this recently. He and his wife had recently uh, moved to another area and had been having trouble finding a, a church. And uh, quite frankly, we're ready to, to give up. Just, you know, 
Um, they'd been listening to sermon podcasts on their own, having meaningful times of prayer, had, you know, Christian friends that they were getting fellowship with. So they were like, uh, why, why do we need to do this? Our marriage isn't in crisis. We're fine. We're, we're growing as believers. And, if, you know, of course, we'd love to find a church family, but is it really necessary? And what I told him was, yes, it, it is absolutely necessary for them to find a church, but not for their good. It's, it sounds like they were doing just fine, honestly. It's, it's necessary for the good of their church. You know, there's, there is a church in your town, wherever you are, wherever God leads you among, in, in his plan, there is a church in your town that needs you. There's, there's a church in the town that needs your manifestation of the Spirit. There's a church in your town to whom God has given a gift, but they're not going to receive that gift unless you're there because that gift is coming through you. You know, there is a, an enormous dignity in being a vessel of God's Spirit, as, as Paul says here. But there's also an enormous responsibility that goes along with it, which is you can't neglect your church. Which leads us to the second way that any of us could ruin this, and that is to fill your schedule. And I'll admit right here, this is, this is the one that has been the most difficult for me at various times in my life. Uh, the primary reason that I might have been unwilling, or as I would have put it at the time, unable to really use my gifts from the Spirit for the common good is not because, like, I didn't know what my gifts were, or it's not because I didn't know how important they were. It's not even because I didn't love the church. It's just because I allowed my schedule to get so crazy busy that I didn't have my flexibility to use my gifts the way that I should. Have have you ever felt that way? Like, you find yourself kind of saying this stuff in your mind, like, boy, I would love to join a small group, but, like, we're busy Every single other weeknight, do we really want another night away from home, away from each other? Or like, oh man, I've always wanted to mentor someone, but man, my schedule is just so demanding right now. I don't have the time for it. Or man, we'd love to have that new family over from church next week, get to know them a little bit better, show some hospitality. But I know that the next three weekends in a row, we're busy. And then after that, it's the holidays. And man, let's try again, maybe in the new year. Have you ever had those kind of conversations with your spouse or had them in the back of your mind? Busyness is an illness of the spirit, says Eugene Peterson. Uh, It's one of the most potentially harmful aspects of modern life to each of us when it comes to our overall spiritual well-being. But right now, I'd also like to point out that busyness can be an illness of the spirit, capital S, meaning it hurts the Holy Spirit and his work right here in our church because our busyness keeps us from using our spiritual gifts, what God has given to us, as radically and as generously as they have been given to us. You know, something that like every book that I've ever read, you know, on how to be a pastor always emphasizes the importance of just ruthlessly leaving some sort of margin in your daily and weekly schedule. Empty space. Space that allows you to say yes when a ministry need comes up. Yes when someone needs your presence or your counsel. Or yes when someone has a weird question that comes up, you know? Well, I would like to invite all of you to try to do the same. How can you make margin in your schedule this fall? How can you ruthlessly create space in your day planner? How can you declutter your life? Not just to fill it then with more stuff necessarily that now you're doing for the church. Like, oh great, now I've got nine obligations every week at FBC. No, not not that. But space for the spirit. Space to use your gifts for the common good as needs arise. How could you do that? I'll end with a parable this morning. This is a um, warning from the mouth of Jesus, which is really along the lines of, 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 of everything that we've been talking about this morning. Again, it, that is the kingdom of heaven, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To each one he gave five bags, or excuse me, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. 
So also the one with two bags gained one more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Man, that would be an armload. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you have entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not gathered scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Stewardship. How we respond to God's generosity to us is a matter of highest importance. Freely we've received. Now freely let us give. Pray with me, please. Father, as I think of the richness of all your gifts, I, I, how can we respond but by saying thank you? Thank you for what you're doing in this church. Thank you for the, the generosity, the kindness, the thoughtfulness, the, sacri- the, the sacrifices so many people in this room have made for the good of what you're building right here at FBC. Thank you for the many ways people have done this that we don't even know about. I ask that by your spirit, you'd help us to remain faithful. Help us as we consider how we might make space, make margin to steward our gifts well for your good, not our good. Help us to be creative in ways that we can do that. But most importantly, help us to see more clearly and more fully what you have done for us and through us in Jesus Christ so that our hearts might overflow with gratitude, gratitude that propels us to sacrifice. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.